Hello, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Hearing. I'm Brian Taylor. Our topic this week is cochlear implants, and with us today to discuss Envoy Medical's early feasibility study of their new acclaimed CI is their CEO, Brent Lucas. Welcome to This Week in Hearing, Brent. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Well, uh, for most of our listeners out there, I think that uh, who are in the hearing care professions, uh, they're, uh, most of them are probably not too familiar with uh, Envoy Medical. Uh, so I thought maybe a, a good first question would be, tell us a little bit about Envoy Medical. Sure. So Envoy Medical is uh, about a 25-year-old startup company. Um, it's based uh, in White Bear Lake. We're a Minnesota company. Um, a lot of employees and investors have been from the Minnesota and Wisconsin area. Uh, St. Croix Medical was what our name was uh, for the first six or seven years. And before that, there was a group called Madison Devices Group uh, that was involved with the project. Then they just ran up against the struggles of trying to uh, you know, develop a medical device that needs FDA approval and, um, and found some folks, uh, Ted Adams, and Ron Gooden uh, were involved in the very beginning, and then uh, company sort of took off from there. Okay. Well, I think I think some of our listeners will be familiar with uh, Saint Croix Medical, so uh, it's good to know about the uh, the recent name change. Yep. Um, yep. Well, uh, and the reason we have you here today, Brent, is to talk about the acclaimed cochlear implant. Um, I saw the press release; uh, looks really intriguing. Uh, tell our audience a little bit about what makes it unique. Sure. Uh, the, the claimed cochlear implant is different from what's currently on the market in that it's fully implanted. It is a fully implanted cochlear implant. So the, the mechanism of operation, if you will, is, is the same as you would expect from a cochlear implant. There is electrical stimulation of the hearing nerve via the cochlea. The big difference for our device is that we use a sensor, a piezoelectric sensor, similar to what's in our esteem device, our first middle ear device. Mm -hmm. We use that to pick up sound that comes in through the ear. And we essentially use the ear as, as the microphone versus an external uh, behind the ear microphone sound processor. We also believe we're different from some of the other approaches to a fully implanted cochlear implant in that we do not have a uh, subdermal microphone, sort of a traditional microphone. And we also are going to have the device fully implanted throughout the day. So you will not have an external device charging it for portions of the day. This will be a, a truly a fully implanted device. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be um, wanting to know more about that. Um, I wanted to kind of dive in a little bit and talk about the early feasibility study. I know that um, one of the uh, neuroautologists at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, right down the, the road from both of us, uh, Dr. Colin Driscoll is involved in that early feasibility study. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're um, uh, trying to accomplish with that? Yes. So for folks who are familiar with class three implantable devices, you probably know that first in human trials in the past were done in other countries and in, in Europe or uh, parts of Asia, maybe uh, south of the border. The FDA started a program called the Early Feasibility Study Program. I believe I have the title right, but I know it's an early feasibility study uh, yeah. program and that they were trying to incentivize American companies and other companies from doing their first in human here in the, in the United States, sort of a, identifying and understanding that we had a desire to get some early human data, especially for a device like ourselves. You can't implant a uh, cochlear implant into a animal per, per se and say, you know, how does that sound? And you can't learn everything that you would like to learn from a bench. So a first in human feasibility study is incredibly important to make sure we're on the right track. And that uh, the FDA has this program, Early Feasibility Study Program, that we then um, are utilizing to get our first in human data points. And so Mayo Clinic, like I said, in our backyard, uh, just happens to have one of the best cochlear implant programs in the world. And Colin Driscoll is one of the best neurotologists that you'll come across, very well-respected, um, 
not a cheerleader, so to speak. So he's going to tell it how it is. And then we also work with uh, Anna Kitsoji, who is uh, going to be the programming CI audiologist for our trial, who's also incredibly steeped in cochlear implant industry, was, was actually on the, on the dark side in, in uh, industry for many years and, and now is um, on the clinical side full time. Oh, so you got some real heavy hitters involved in the project, which is great, great to know. Yeah, no, we have a, we have a wonderful, sorry to interrupt you, but we have a wonderful advisory board. We call it the Cochlear Implant Advisory Board. We have folks from Stanford, uh, Washington University of St. Louis. We have some private practice individuals, Leahy Clinic. So we've really tried to get some of, like you said, heavy hitters, but people that are also going to make sure that we're on the right path. Always important with something like this. Right. Um, assuming that the, the feasibility study goes well, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, who might be a candidate for the acclaimed CI? Sure. The, uh, the early feasibility study indications are what you would expect from sort of the traditional CI indications in that it's profound or severe to profound, I should say, hearing loss. Um, I know the industry is moving up to moderate to profound in terms of their indications, we are, you know, we're focused on sort of demonstrating to the FDA that we're safe before they, they let us move up. Um, the idea being that we will follow the trend of the industry in going to, you know, moderate to profound as we, as we go through our pivotal trial. But the, uh, the indications are, are severe to profound and then your typical, you know, 40% speech to scrim sort of line of um, they have to have worse hearing than that. Um, they can't be deafened for too long a period of time because we want to make sure that we're actually testing how the implant works and not up against some of the natural atrophy of a, of a brain that's been, you know, unstimulated for many decades. Um, right. So I would say, and you can't, obviously can't have a lot of benefit from hearing aids. So it's just very typical cochlear implant indications. And then you'll need to, you know, have general health of being able to undergo anesthesia uh, general anesthesia, as well as, you know, no contraindications related to the, the implant itself. Uh, we, as I mentioned, it's a fully implanted device. We didn't really talk about the fact that the battery pack uh, will be in the, in the chest. And so if you have uh, other hardware in there, uh, it's, uh, right now we're going to say you're contraindicated so we don't, we don't uh, cross waves, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, is it accurate to say that the uh, acclaim would be um, uh, for adults and not pediatrics? Correct. Sorry, that's a big point. Yes, uh, this is for adults only uh, for the early feasibility study and expect that to be the case for this version of the device going forward. Something to look forward to down the road. That's right. That's right. Well, I wanted to ask you, um, I know it, a few. we've had a few episodes uh, here on the channel uh, talking about the relatively low uptake of CIs among adults, the fact that many of them go in to see their hearing care professional and they don't even know that they're a candidate for a cochlear implant. And, I, you know, as you already kind of mentioned, uh, the, the candidacy requirements over the last few years for CIs have broadened in adults. Um, could you speak maybe more generally to uh, how the profession can raise awareness in adults uh, uh, the, av the availability and the benefits from cochlear implants? Sure. I, I, um, I'd love to. I, I have some thoughts that some are probably a little controversial. Um, you know, you can't, you can't talk to a, an industry that covers uh, 40 million people without rubbing a few of them the wrong way. <laughs> I would say that um, there's a couple of things. One is I, I'm sort of a, and I think on, when I say I, Envoy is sort of an inside outsider, if you will. We're in the hearing industry, but nobody really has embraced middle ear implants. There's a lot of skeletons on the side of the road of the hearing industry, and many of them are middle ear implants. And a large reason, if not the only reason, is that it's not covered by insurance. Middle ear implants are not broadly reimbursed. And it's hard to get market acceptance for a product that is not reimbursed. Uh, it's hard for an audiologist as much as they may want to recommend that product. It's hard for them to think, boy, how's the patient going to pay for this? How are they going to have the care long-term? How's this, how am I going to be reimbursed? How's the surgeon going to be reimbursed? Um, 
So that is a significant problem. And I would say, and this is where it gets a little controversial, I would say that's at the feet of the profession. I think uh, audiologists and surgeons need to push for hearing loss to be taken more seriously by the, the broad politicians, the societies, and, and everything like that. I think the big manufacturers, and I'm just making all sorts of friends today, but I think the big, uh, the big manufacturers have a vested interest in keeping the status quo. Uh, there's not a lot of desire to see small companies like Envoy or some of the others to, to get a foothold. And, and the reason for that is because they make a lot of money in the status quo. There's, you know, it doesn't take a, a, an MBA to understand why they don't want to, uh, things to change. Mm -hmm. So if there's going to be change, it's going to have to come from audiologists and it's going to have to come from the societies and, and professions that represent audiology and, and surgeons. Um, so changing subjects a, a little bit in terms of adult CI candidates. Yes, the penetration is incredibly low. If you look at some of the uh, publications on the matter, or if you're at talks and listen to folks, you'll hear numbers between 3% penetration for adult CIs up to 10. So sort of the bookends are still incredibly low. Um, we say 5%. We've done some market research to suggest it's, it's right around 5%. Um, I think there's the obvious reason is there's stigma around cochlear implants. Uh, folks do not want, a lot of the folks that we've talked to do not want to have the externals either for stigma or quality of life. I think that's a real concern. I know it's not necessarily PC to say that, um, that there is folks who want an invisible device, but they, there are folks who want an invisible device. You ask a surgeon or an audiologist one-on-one, -on -one, what's your biggest complaint? And they say, it's the externals. People don't want that. I pull out the hardware, I put it on the table and they say they don't want it. Uh, so I think that's it. I think the other is, is that there are a lot of competing interests within the hearing industry. There's the quote unquote hearing aid audiologists, and then you have your implant audiologists, and there hasn't been a great um, uh, synergy between everybody involved. I know that people are working on that, and that's not to, to paint with broad strokes, but there are definitely ways to improve bringing everybody under the tent. And I, I'm just a big believer in the fact that, you know, the, the old adage, high tides raise all ships. And I think if we're going to, if we really want the hearing industry to be what it can be, you need competition, you need innovation, and we all need to work together. Otherwise, um, and not to go on too much of a weird tangent, but I think you're going to see some of like the brain interface companies and some other people go after the hearing industry um, because if you can just bypass the ear altogether and go right to the brain, why, why not? So I think the hearing industry really needs to, to adopt new technologies, or I think they're, they're going to be up against it in the future. Yeah, no, I think that's all really well said. And for all you hearing care professionals, audiologists, hearing instrument specialists out there listening, uh, you know, based on my 30 years experience uh, as an audiologist, I know that in your clinic, there are probably a couple of patients that um, are not doing as well as we want them to with their hearing aids that need to know about uh, devices like the acclaimed CI, uh, just CIs in general. Um, so if you're out there, uh, please get familiar with the new candidacy requirements. Uh, yep. Find out where you can refer these patients for uh, implants for a workup. I think that's really important to kind of broaden your scope of, uh, of care. Yeah, and I, I don't know when this is going to air, but I know there's still some comment period on the CMS proposed guidelines. And I think that's been something that Terry Zolan and, and Craig Buckman have worked on for many, many years. And I started when John DeParco, I believe, was, was still alive. And you should voice your support for that because that is, is helpful. And there's also the, um, the Audiologist Reimbursement Act that's, I don't remember the title for it. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things that can be pushed for. It's a huge market and we should we should really try to take care of ourselves uh, so that we can take care of patients. Exactly. No better. Yeah, thanks for all the insights. Um, final question or final uh, thing I'd like to learn from you, uh, Brent, and that is uh, if people want to know more about the Acclaim feasibility study, if they want to know more about Envoy Medical, do you have a website? Where can people learn more? Yeah, I appreciate that. 
Um, envoymedical.com is, is our uh, website. And um, we have some social media presence on Facebook and LinkedIn um, and Twitter. And so find us on there. I don't remember our handles off the top of my head, but Envoy Medical will probably be a good, a good way to find us. And then if you're interested in the early feasibility study, you should reach out directly to, if you're, if you're a patient or a potential candidate, you should reach out directly to Mayo Clinic. They handle all of that. Um, and, and, and Envoy is, is not, not involved in that. Um, and then if you want to just know more about Envoy in general, we have a great customer experience manager. Her name is Amy Padula, and she is a bilateral esteem patient. And so feel free to call her and talk to her about the device, either device and our patient experience. It's good to know. Uh, Brent Lucas, CEO of Envoy Medical, talking with us today about the uh, acclaimed CI and the early feasibility study that they're undergoing with uh, folks at Mayo Clinic at Rochester. Uh, thanks again, Brent, for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for your interest, and, and I really appreciate the time.